Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Weeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Alex Hall. Hi, Alex. Hi, Sue. It's lovely to speak to you today, Alex, and we were just chatting before there. Now, Alex, I should I should have met Alex several times in person because she is in the Scunthorpe Embroidery Skill branch and I'm in the Hull one, so we are literally over, over the river. Um, and our branch has had several forays into North Lincolnshire to go and visit Scunthorpe branch, but um, for various reasons I haven't been able to go. So we haven't actually met, although, as I say, we should do, but we've just been planning that, so we'll, we'll put that right very shortly. So anyway, n- nice to speak to you, Alex. Thank you. Right, uh, I've got a bio here for Alex. I'm a creative magpie and jack-of-all-trades, including textile artist, beachcomber, found object lover, upcycler, jeweller, bookbinder and writer. I'm always on the lookout for shiny new ideas and techniques to spark my imagination, whether that is using a needle and thread or a sander and a blowtorch. However, my first love is textiles, and that is a huge part of pretty much everything else I dabble in. I long to have a go at everything and greedily want 36 hours in each day to try, test and explore my latest passion to its full extent. There we are. Well, that's lovely. Now, and I'll do your links now because I've been forgetting terribly recently. So um, the best place is to find Alex. She has a really nice blog, right? And um, some lovely stories on there. And that's been going for quite a long time, hasn't it, Alex, your blog? Yeah, I started 2011. Yeah, so it's 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 a brilliant uh, resource is Alex's blog. Um, so that's under a com, And she's also got an Etsy shop as well and that's also under the name of Under a Topaz Sky. Now of course those links will be in Alex's episode on stitcherystories.com so they'll be easy to um, find and um, we've also got Alex's email on there as well contact details and she's not on any other social medias but we were just talking about Instagram. Yeah so that will I think that will be happening very shortly. <laughs> Um, so there we are. So that's all the links and everything. So then, Alex, before we get started further with your stitchery story today, would you like to share with us what you are working on at the moment and what's got you excited? Well, the problem is I'm working on all sorts of things. I've just got, I usually have far too much on the go. Mm-hmm. So I'm working on something and then all of a sudden something else will pop up. So for instance, somebody gave me the bottom of the leg of a pair of jeans. <laughs> like you do <laughs> well, like they do yes because they know that I will <laughs> just take all this stuff on board and do <laughs> with it and I looked at it and I thought oh I could embroider that and I could put that in I could make a bag and I've just made some costumes for a show that I've been involved in and there's some amazing sea green satin left and that would be lovely in this bag and so yes instead of actually carrying on with the um the buyer stitch baby leaf tail dragon that I'm working on or finishing the blue work or doing my song <laughs> all of a sudden the bag has just sort of happened and yeah that's why I need 36 hours in the day <laughs> <laughs> but I'm doing I mean I'm this year I'm trying to I'm branching out into teaching classes and workshops mainly in the area but branching out so I'm working on samples for that stitch play is a big one so looking at simple felt shapes that can be stitched onto a felt background so nothing's going to fray Mm -hmm. and then embellishing them with all sorts of stitches because I think very often we tend to default to perhaps a small core of favourite stitches and I'm sure most people have got books and books and books of different (laughs) and do you ever do them and so yeah, I, I actually did this as a stitch play workshop at Scunthorpe Embroiderers Guild last December and it worked really well. So yeah. that's what I'm offering because yeah. you can take it right down to I only know how to do running stitch, in which case you can do all the whipped and threaded running stitches and all the rest of it, right up to yes, I know all that, but 
you know, actually, I've always fancied to go at Rosette Chain or Gordian Knot Stitch or something like that, where somebody can really push themselves on. So that's so doing those samples is is quite exciting. Yeah, that's a really good idea as well. Because I mean, well, anybody who's listened to this, you know that I go on about how much I love back stitch. You know, I, I, I do I do know lots of stitches, but it seems to be my default setting. And I do yeah. sit there think times. Right, come on, get some of those books out, Susan, and practice some other stitches and we did um, a, a good workshop with Shirley Smith last year um, Shirley was one of my early guests and we did Bayer stitch there and um, I was just thinking I, I ambitiously decided to do a because it's based on the Stamford Bridge tapestry the things that we did and um, I ambitiously decided to do a person in a boat you know the whole lot instead of just doing a duck I could no, I was going to do so ob- obviously so far I've done the sail that's it I really must get on with that but um, I enjoyed doing that. That was something new. And you say it's funny that you brought in the uh, the dragon because that's featured on your blog as well, isn't yeah. it? That you've gone back to it. Yeah, I did. I, have, I do love uh, Bayer Stitch works up really quickly now for somebody who's spent goodness knows how long trying to do French knot pieces. <laughs> My Victorian writing box project. It's so nice when something works. <laughs> so. Yes, I know. Now that's encouraged me to get on with that because I have very little time to do any stitching at the moment. I spend more time doing this on my work. So yeah, I, I will go back to that. But uh, I was just going to say, I, I, I did look at your latest blog entry, and I, and I loved how you how you brought it in. Sneaks back in looking shamefaced was the first sentence on the blog. <laughs> <laughs> and that just summed up the challenge that we all have with keeping up with our uh, our blogs and so forth. But um, yours is lovely, so please keep up with it. Thank you. Well, I've, I, I literally have just posted this morning, just before I spoke to you. I've got a new one on about the um, costumes that I've made for this for this um, for this show. Brilliant. So, um, have, so yes, I've, after a, another fortnight out because I've been frantically stitching, then yes, I'm back in again, and I've <laughs> had to have a break because the finishing for the two dresses was so intensive um i actually made holes in both fingers i can't use a thimble i should be able to but i can't so i've had to actually wait a week for my fingers to um heal. oh no <laughs> no stitching for a week <laughs> far too much um far too much playing on the on the uh, tablet and uh, watching back episodes of bake off <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. And um, yeah, so we're, we're looking forward uh, at um, Hull Branch. So Alex is going to come and do a workshop for us in March, I think. So we're only a small branch, there's only 10 of us. So it's a special treat when we get we rope somebody in to come and do a workshop with us. So we're doing found objects, I think, found objects embroidered. So I'm trying to push everybody to do different things as well. So uh, yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to that one, Alex. Brilliant. So that's a nice set of um, things to be excited about. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there on trying one thing and starting another and doing another. So it, um, yeah. it, it's exciting, but then it can get a bit overwhelming sometimes, can't it? Then we realise we've got too many things on the go. It can. I mean, as a child, my mother was always very much, you finish one thing and then you move on to another. Mm. And particularly as a child, you, you know, I'm going to knit a scarf for my bear and you knit three inches and you really don't want to do anything else. So I was very, I always very much, well, I can't do something until I've finished. And several years ago, we had Chris Beavers who came to Scunthorpe to talk about her doll making. Oh, yes, brilliant. And oh, she was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And she was literally throwing, I literally throwing these partial bits of dolls out to us because they were her I wonder what happens if and they weren't finished and it was this huge light bulb moment of oh my goodness you don't she doesn't have to finish it she's just finding out if this technique will work what will happen if I do that oh right yes it's worked no it hasn't and there they were they were just they were what they were it was it was like a huge light bulb came on and I thought (laughs) you know what I don't have to finish this doesn't have to be something Mm. your husband's saying okay what's this going to be oh, do you know men say that don't you just don't it's, say that you're going to get killed <laughs> it's not going to be anything it's just what it is it is you know, no i'm not i don't want to frame it i don't want to hang it i don't want to make it into a cushion for goodness sake i'm not into cushions um it's just going to be what it is and that was really and i've stopped completely stop beating myself up about it Yay. if it gets finished it gets finished if it doesn't it doesn't it was just that's what I fancied doing at that point in time yes I tell you what that's that's a huge weight off 
it really really is yes that's that's very interesting actually that you've that you've raised that point now we know we have the kind of bit of a laugh about unfinished objects further on so maybe we'll we'll see what comes out of that one but you mentioned there about your um your mum insisting that you finish things off so how did you you know first get interested in embroidery and textile art alex well actually it's nothing to really to do with my mum my mum is a functional stitcher right she doesn't approve of but she approves of making clothes and she approves of darning and mending but doing stuff that's not useful frivolous stitching it's frivolous <laughs> yes i mean certainly she's because my mum's in her 80s mm. so she was of that generation where in wartime your clothes were made she was making her own clothes in the 50s she made my clothes and my brother's clothes same generation as my mum she did exactly the same yes and um, she went to tailoring classes when i was very little and i remember various ensembles some some in the 70s this was some successful some less successful <laughs> i did have a fight aged about nine with a boy in my class who said that the skirt i was wearing which was in a red boucle fabric was actually a piece of carpet <laughs> was down the end of the field and we had a fight of which i won and made him take it back um <laughs> And I, but I never wore the skirt again, even though I'd won the fight, I never wore it again. Everything was infested with rickrack braid as well, if I remember. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> but my mum had on her shelves um, a copy of the Mary Thomas book of embroidery stitches, and this had been a school prize for needlework. Right. And I love the pictures. I love the little cartoon pictures in it. I then wanted to embroider. And again, like so many women of that generation, they had all those tron- boxes of iron-on transfers. Oh, uh, I've got a box full of those. I love those. <laughs> that come free with various magazines. Yes. So she let me have a tray cloth. And I used to go through the, through the box and I would choose a little motif. I'd iron it on the tray cloth. I mean, randomly, these were all sorts of things, you know, a flower here, a butterfly here, a lamb here. And then I would go into the Mary Thomas. And I would choose a stitch for it and teach myself that stitch. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But I I didn't really have anywhere I could go with it. Mm. I had a wonderful next door neighbour who was like, she was the best grandmother I never had. Mm -hmm. And she taught me to crochet very early and later to knit. And then with the knitting, I'm sort of, we're now into sort of the late seventies and there was early eighties. There was a bit of an explosion with different, completely different yarns. And Jan, and I got hold of Jan Messon's book, Have You Any Wool? And all of a sudden it was about knitting that wasn't garments. You know, I didn't have to, you know, the thought of me knitting, sitting down for hours and hours and hours and knitting a jumper or a cardigan or something. No, that wasn't going to happen. But Have You Any Wool, which is still actually one of my favourite books, was just this explosion of colour and knitting and making these amazing little fungi and lichen and stuff, mm. and stuff like that. And I just really went down the knitting line. And it wasn't until a bit later on. It was actually, it was, I don't know if you remember, it was again, it was a really big last century. Back of a magazine, you would have book clubs. And it might be a military book club. And, you know, here's a selection and you can get four for 50p. And then you've got to sign up for however long. Anyway, I often used to look and think, oh, you know, if I was going to join this, what books would I do? You do your fantasy selection. And one day it was a sewing and craft book club. And I looked at the books and I thought, well, and by this point I was working, I'd got a little bit of disposable income. So I joined the book club and one of the first books I had was Embroidery Techniques from East and West, Texture and Colour for Quilters and Embroiderers by Money Trevor Starr. And she was doing, she was doing crazy patchwork. Right. And I completely fell in love. <laughs> and that all of a sudden stitching just completely started again all of a sudden I just wanted to I just wanted to stitch there's this wonderful thing called eBay and on eBay you buy up other people's fabrics and threads <laughs> and stuff and so uh, yeah thanks to eBay and thanks to other things all of a sudden it just took off and by the, I, th- I suppose I've probably been stitching really really seriously now for about 25 years but there was just this huge hiatus in the middle where stitch where the knitting was more of a thing so yeah I suppose it was very much so self-taught you know and Mary Thomas is where it all started yeah no that's really interesting actually I'd say that the the self-taught route is is often a very 
you know, most of mine is I can't remember anyone really showing me. I did the same sort of thing. I had some iron-on transfers from the old lady next door. I've still got this box full of a hoot. And uh, I used to sit and, you know, do pillowcases and stuff like that just to get going with it. But, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting path. So, obviously, people have been, you mentioned the lady next door was a, an inspiration to getting you going. Have you got any particular major inspirations over the years and, and also currently, Alex? Well, I, I mentioned Jan Lessons, Have You Any Wool? And, yes. she, and she still inspires me massively. Um, I mean, pretty much everything she does, I just look at and think, yes, I just want to play, you know, with these ideas. And it's one, I don't think, no, it's her last, but one of her recent books, which is the Celtic Viking Anglo-Saxon Embroidery. That's really, that format has really provided the inspiration for my current Dorian Gray project. Right. That's mentioned on my blog. There are certain books, you know, you know of them, but perhaps have never read them. And I'm mm. a huge fan of Wilde's plays, but I've never been quite so sure about his prose. I have not read The Picture of Dorian Gray, and it was free for Kindle. So popped it on Kindle, read it. Right. One of the big things that Gray does, because he's not ageing, he's able to indulge his passion for collecting. There's a section in the middle where Wilde just does these long catalogues. You know, he gets into furniture and this is all the furniture he has. He gets into painting and this is all the painting he has. And all of a sudden, there's a section where he's into textiles. Mm. And that, re well, it really made me sit up in that, oh my goodness, this is something that was written late 19th century yes when, yes textiles are huge but the people who are doing the embroidery are these women who are out workers and he's talking he and he does this whole list of these sumptuous ideas things of uh, like medieval bed hangings and somebody's sleeves which are embroidered with music and four pearls are used, being used for the notes where they use square notes. Oh, yeah. And I just read it and I just thought, I want these textiles. I want to see them. But where are they? What are they? Yeah. And Sting, as well as the ones that are, they are pseudo historical ones. He then talks about ones embroidered with beetle wings, um, about taffetas and laces and all sorts of stuff and it was mouth-watering it really really was so I, I typed the whole section out and then <laughs> I, what if what if there was a collection what if I could do a book of samples this is all that's left of these wall, these hangings these this this robe this this cope this whatever and so I've just made a start basically on the one at the top of the list, which is the great crocus-coloured robe on which the gods fought against the giants worked for the pleasure of Athena. So I looked into this, like Athena, so it's Greek. Yeah. Dying with saffron, turmeric, safflower. Right, yes. All my fabrics died. It is ongoing. I'm going to say this sounds like an epic project inspired by some prose in a book. A really interesting way. And I can, I can tell you're excited about it as well. Yes, I am, because I have to say, I've just, I've just dug the pile of stuff out and looking at it again, and I'm thinking, oh, do you know what? I really, really, really want to start this. And yes. Go on to the, the curious table napkins wrought for the priests of the sun, on which were displayed all the dainties and viands that could be wanted for a feast. Oh, it's just going to keep you busy for years. <laughs> I have to say, when I first posted about it, somebody who follows my, my blog sort of extensively said, yeah, this is a lifetime project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a, definitely a lifetime project. But it's also one that can be broken down because part of my problem is I don't, it's like with the garments, the thought of actually sitting and knitting a whole jumper that's big, that, that's, where I that's where I tend to fall down. So maybe it's, it lends itself into the, back to this samples idea, doesn't it? The samples of, you, you could rather than having to create that finished thing, it's the yeah. samples of how it would have been created, but you don't have to create, you, know, you can get yourself out of it that way, couldn't you? Yes, exactly. And the idea is that these are obviously, as they're described by Wilde, things that are very ancient. Mm. So there would only be scraps and now you would only have those fragments left. Yes. Work your way around it that way. <laughs> now, now, you mentioned 
the the way in which you pick stitches and then say, well, come on, let's go and do a, a new kind of stitch or let's a, a enhance a kind of stitch. So is there any, you mentioned Bayer stitch for making up quickly and, and French knots, because don't we all just love French knots in a cluster, but don't they take ages? So ha have you any specific standout techniques? Although I know you have said you're kind of a magpie. So is, is there anything you can particularly share with us there in terms of techniques and why do you like them so much, Alex? I think my big thing is making something, it's this found objects that I'm doing with you, yeah. make something from bits that someone else has discarded. Mm. So the bottom of the jeans leg. I love beach combing, pavement combing. You know, the children will quite happily stand there while I go, oh, look, there's a rusty washer down there. I must pick that up. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, Mother, please don't. <laughs> I love, you know, having those things and saying, do you know what? That could be doing that. I could do that. I could add that into that. And I love combining worked metal and embroidery as well. I did a silversmithing course about five years ago. Ah, oh, right. And I've still got a lot of those bits and pieces, particularly reticulating metal, where you heat it and the impurities come to the top. So it means the top, sorry, is a higher melting point than underneath. Ah, oh, right, well, yes. Underneath melts and it bubbles and you get... It looks like crumpled paper or a mountain range. So you know, it's a real big thing for me. And, and combining it with embroidery is just, I love that, the hardness of the metal and the, the softness of the embroidery and the colours. That's something that I absolutely love. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting approach. Yes, I absolutely love French knots and have worked probably millions of them. <laughs> Feather Stitch is another huge favourite of mine. And that's back to the Crazy Patchwork. Right, yes. Uh, split Stitch, as well as a big favourite. I like that for, particularly if I'm doing text, because I like to include text in things as well. I find it goes better around corners for me than Stem Stitch. I, I totally agree. I'm hopeless at Stem Stitch, going around corners with it. I've, yeah, I've, I've watched umpteen videos and looked at loads of diagrams and I just, I don't know. Stem uh, Split Stitch, yeah, I've got into that for, for text. The project I did with some text on it. Yeah, I'm going to use that. Stuff Stem Stitch. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> split stitch i like the way it kind of looks like little hearts as well and if you do it really small it's yeah yeah like very, very much so um and i'm really enjoying by a stitch at the moment again partly because that that works up so quickly yeah i need to get onto mine definitely <laughs> so so what, what would you say with all of these things that you've done so far alex what what has been the, the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far have you got anything that kind of springs to mind with that I never really thought much about the stitching and certainly when I joined the Embroiderers Guild and that's always a bit of a, oh my goodness, there are all these people and they do like real embroidery and goodness. And also because it's something that you, certainly when I started, it was the very early days of the internet mm. and you, you were doing it in isolation. Embroidery was the sort of thing that, that your grandma did and nobody was sewing. Nobody was, sewing. Nobody was sewing in school. In fact, when I started stitching with the uh, junior age children that I taught for years, they there wasn't a, this is a girl's thing, because none of them saw anybody stitch. Ah, right. Well, that's, that's an interesting aspect that we don't think about, yeah. No, when I was in school, you know, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm. the girls all did the stitching, the boys went off, and goodness knows what the boys did, actually, I can't think. Uh, but. Uh, we did all, we did, no, the, we, the boys did stitching, and we did as well, and we did, we all did the same. So yeah. we would do metalwork and woodwork with the boys and the boys did, you know, so it was part of, you had a term each or something like that. So I thought that was quite good, actually. But it was sort of very much, this is, you know, the sewing is what the girls do, the boys do something else. But actually stitching in school, because they don't see anybody sew at all at home. And again, I've worked in quite deprived areas where, mm. you know, actually doing this as a hobby either. Without, without exception, my best stitches have all been boys. And some of the very best have been some of the very naughtiest. Wow. It was challenging. One particular child who, I hesitate to say this because sometimes it's just naughtiness, but I do believe he had ADHD, mm. uh, mastered bullying knots at 10. And then he, every time we had a, a lesson, a, an art lesson while we were doing stitching, he'd be going around and he'd be showing other children how to do French knots and bullying knots, which was a lot better than his usual um habits in the lesson but no they were my 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 best stitches have always been the most challenging boys wow what, what a lovely thing to to witness you know and to encourage as you say in the just a, a little window in their life where 
their habits were changed and they were just engrossed with something totally different. That's lovely. Yes, I think that's probably a high point. Absolutely. In terms of sort of going back to what I was saying about being in the Guild, um, back in about 2011, I like to stitch when I go on holiday. And again, this is this crazy patchwork. And I was making these little postcard size pieces and using blue and yellow fabric and threads. And I stitched them on holiday in Cornwall over about two or three years. And then, I think, then when I did them, I edged them with ribbon and then stitched them onto a background and just had it on the wall. Beginning of last year, I think, we were looking at Paisley's with somebody. From, it was a workshop run by our, one of our guild members. Yeah. And, and I laughed because she pulled up one image and it was an image from my blog <laughs> of a Paisley from this particular hanging. Yeah. And I live very, very close to where we meet. So I had to nip home for lunch anyway. <laughs> so I brought it back and said, look, I thought you'd like to see it in real life, which point everybody went, oh my goodness. And people raved about it and I suppose it's like something you know I'd woken up to it every day I didn't really think much about it what it said to me was a holiday where I'd stitched I'd stitched the memories of that place in so I could yeah. point to and say I remember sitting in a traffic jam on the A30 <laughs> I remember being on the beach at Marrow's Iron and stitching that bit and I remember that bit came from and this is some, some you know fabric that I found wherever yeah. so I was just really surprised and some and at that point our regional chair, who happens to be a member of our guild, was had just started a competition for a piece of embroidery to be used on cards and sort of marketing and stuff. Oh, for, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, the Yorkshire and the Humber region. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah. So each branch had a, a bit of a competition at their level. And then the winners all went through to region. So somebody said, oh, why don't you put it in that? And I wasn't, it, it was one I wasn't even there for. Um, so came back and there's a note through the door saying, oh, by the way, congratulations, it's won. <laughs> Fantastic. And Pauline's taken it away to regional. I was like, wow, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And I didn't go to, and I, and I wasn't able to go to regional either. And then all of a sudden I got an email going, uh, by the way, it's been picked. It's actually won. And I'm like, no. Yay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really has happened. And um, yes, it's all over all these cuts. On the cards, isn't it, that we can send out, yes. Or on the cards. And Pauline's hung on to it. In fact, I've only just got it back. Um, and I did pick up the plastic bag it was in the other day and go, what's in here? Oh, yes! <laughs> I, I remember that. <laughs> Toured all over and people have raved about it. And I think one of the things is uh, that it was a place where I'd tried out loads and loads of different stitches. Oh, I'd, right. I'd go, oh, what stitcher can we use on here? Oh, I know. I've read something about, oh, I don't know, Jacobean laid work. All oh, right, well, I'll do a bit of Jacobean laid work on this, or, or I'll stitch some shells onto this, or, oh, I've found a beaded stitch called Oglala beading. I'll, I'll, Oglala butterfly, that was it. I'll do some of that down there. So it's actually full of, as Pauline pointed out to me, it's actually full chock full of so many different techniques there's stomach work on there there's beading there's flat embroidery there's jacobean there's cruel work there's you name it pretty much it's on there um and also it's in that victorian tradition of the crazy patchwork right yes yeah. so there's it's a whole smorgasbord of lovely techniques then as well no wonder people were interested in looking at it then it's been interesting to see something that i'd sort of gone well yeah it's something i did it's something quite early to actually for it to have one regional i mean how amazing is that that's yeah that's brilliant and to perpetuate in postcards as well and be sent out to people yes yeah yeah it blows me out well i just look and think i can't believe that's me i really really can't well, well, I think that's that's a that is wonderful that it's ticked so many boxes for for so many different reasons as well. So you know, let, let's try and get as much bang for our buck out of what we do, and that certainly has, hasn't it, Alex? So well done on that one. <laughs> right? Have you got a disaster? Something funny for us to laugh at on that? Well, again, it was it was in Bros Girls. It was very early on, and in Yorkshire and Humber, we have a yearly regional condition, which is a flower beginning with. Oh, and yes. Right at the beginning, this is a flower beginning with A. And I had this fantastic idea for, for an allium. I'd seen, I'd seen the Sashiko exhibition at York Library and Gallery, where it was modern Sashiko, where they'd used sections of fabric and then 
that had gone on water soluble fabric and it'd been stitched over and it's and then dissolved so you've got these pieces that hung together in this net mm. and alliums are lots of little flowers that make up a big one so i i thought i'll, I'll do this so i did all these very small embroideries and bits of chiffon <laughs> i put them on water soluble fabric and my machine is a 1928 frister and rossman that belonged to my great grandmother which i love it will what it doesn't stitch is nobody's business yeah so there i am stitching away oh yeah yeah and i got about nine tenths of the way through it and the machine seized up <laughs> and there was nothing i could do so i should have left it and gone to bed yeah but i didn't i decided that yeah yeah probably enough stitching and i was going to dissolve the soluble fabric but it was a really big piece and i'd never used a piece that big and i was a little bit robust and so it sort of crumpled and, oh, and I no. tried to press it and I melted some of the chiffon and the one that was laid out with these melted bit, I just looked at it and thought, oh my God, I hate it. And I don't know what I'm going to do with it and how I'm going to hang it. And that point, sensibly, I left it, went to bed in despair. <laughs> went to the work the next day and with the glimmerings of an idea, the idea of actually sticking onto a background, found this piece of green organza in a cupboard and then spent five hours because we're talking about something which is a three a two all right yeah big stitching the whole five hours hand stitching it to the organza every few millimeters it been any prizes but at least it was fit to be seen <laughs> well i think you, you kind of did well there with the range of things that went wrong broken sewing machine <laughs> It all drop into bits. What else was that? And the melting. The melting it, melting it as well. <laughs> it was well distressed, wasn't it, by the time you'd finished? Well, it was an absolute disaster. <laughs> <laughs> like one of these days I might just cut it cut it up back into the into the miniatures and just say, you know, that 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 is it's done. It's That's all. it, yeah. Uh well, you know, that was a rich a rich learning experience, wasn't it, Alex? <laughs> certainly was don't try all these new te- techniques on something you actually want to put into for a competition oh i know well we're terrible aren't we we're just oh, i'm going to do this and set off well i am anyway and it's just like oh stop it do some planning <laughs> right now then um well here we are we could talk all day about a lot of this this has been fascinating so basically alex i know you've mentioned your your epic project and various bits and pieces you've got on the go at the moment so have you any specific plans and projects that you'd like to share with us today as we kind of come to the end of our fascinating chat well after 30 years uh, at the chalk face i took redundancy in eight and i've decided that actually i'm not quite old enough to retire yet i'd like to make a live I'd, i really would like to make a living from my creativity and talking to people like you know like alison at your guild yes who's successfully done that and Chris Gray is also Chris Gray is amazing. She's, she's she was an uh, early early guest as well. Yeah, she's so inspirational. Is yeah, that that's something I just I love creating. I love passing it on. I've taught a, I've taught some workshops for our guild, and it's just the pleasure of you know getting an idea out there of seeing people find something and take it on. You know, really back to this ability. You know, watching these these naughty boys because that's frankly what they were you know taking on the stitching and going wow look what I've done with this yeah that's really that's really where I want where I want to go I'd love to be able to make a living from my creativity and and sharing it teaching it particularly sharing it with other people and saying yeah let's move that on particularly at a point when in schools that's Mm -hmm. what's been squeezed out it's just gone right yeah after I after I'd um left I went back a term later to pick some stuff up and I'd had a cupboard in my room which where I'd kept all the textile stuff together there was a large box in a cupboard that was, we called vault but what nurse in there and I looked and literally somebody I think had just put an arm into this cupboard and swept everything all the <sighs> threads all the needles all the ribbons all the gold work threads everything that I'd kept together it was just in a cardboard box shoved in the back of a cupboard Oh dear. And it's it's such a shame that, you know, education's come to that. So if I can, you know, keep getting it out there so people can still enjoy it, then yeah, that's that's really what I'm hoping for in my future. So that's that's your plan then to move now into you say more formally rather than doing doing it on the side kind of thing, is to now more formally move into workshops and developing other 
money making schemes basically to um, c- keep on working in this area. So, well, it's going to be a very interesting journey for you, Alex. I'm very sure, and to say we're, we're certainly looking forward to seeing you in March. Well, that's been absolutely wonderful talking with you. Um, we've got your links in your episode. Alice, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking with you today. I've really, really enjoyed our chat. And as ever, we could carry on all day, but um, it's lunchtime and I need to go and have some lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. It's been fantastic. And we, uh, we'll all keep our eyes open to see what, what happens next. Thank you very much. It's been a joy to talk to you. It really has been so much fun. Thank you. Brilliant. Speak to you later, Alex. Bye. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitch Me Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories.